Do not trade the election, okay? Do not trade the election. There is an early voting bombshell that has Kamala in trouble before election day. So do not trade the election. How y'all doing today? Happy Monday. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, outliers. Good to see all of you all. Um, thank you for making sure you came to the right time. I know for our inter er, international audience, this is always a confusing time. Uh, because the United States is pretty much the only country, if it is the only country, that uh, changes its time twice a year. And that, that throws everybody else for a loop, I know. Uh, so thank you all for making it. Glad to see everybody. Michael is here. Wes is here. Dave is here. Peter's here. Jean-Louis here. Yorn is here. Bob is here. Mikey Mike is here. And Tug is here. Good to see everybody. It's so exciting to see you all today. I got to tell you, I think the market is sitting and waiting. Right, sitting and waiting because we 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 got some stuff going on, right? So we got some big things going on. Europe also, I I didn't know they changed it. I'll have to ask ChatGPT. We got some stuff going on out in the uh, out in the real world, and the market's like, hold tight, <laughs> we don't know where this is going, so we're gonna hang out right here until the election is done because we it is elections eve. I had someone, uh, one of my friends texted me today and he said, hey, it's election eve. You need to uh, leave a McDonald's cheeseburger and a Diet Coke out for Santa Trump. That way he uh, will, <laughs> will get all the votes. And I thought that was pretty funny. Um, but it's good to see all you guys. I hope you had a great week and I hope your Halloween went well. Um, what I mean, a lot's happened since now and then, then right? We, we skipped on Friday. Um, but you know what? All is good. All is good. So let's jump right into our market analysis and we're going to get busy. All right. Welcome to the outlier trading room. This is smart trading made simple. Oh, real quick, right quick. It's storming here. So if the internet goes out, it's out. I apologize, but I'm going to put that uh, out ahead of time. This is where we save time, make money and start winning with less risk together as a team. And for those of you who don't know me, I uh, my name is Christopher Yule. I've twice been awarded top 100 people in finance. I've been successfully trading since 2009. I'm a partner with Outlier, and this is my style of trading using the Outlier data. And I call it the golden ticket trading strategy. Dave says it definitely looks like it's just sitting and waiting. Yeah, for sure. So real quick, how does Outlier work? Well, it's a four-step process. Number one, Outlier monitors how investors are reacting to changing market conditions, uh, news, price movements, and the economy. Number two, Outlier determines if investors are acting irrationally fearful or greedy and by how much. Number three, Outlier gives buy and sell signals when those irrational behaviors reach an extreme. And number four, allowing you to get into the stock before the Outlier move happens. Speaking of Outlier moves happening, do not trade the election, okay? Do not trade the election. Um, there is an early voting bombshell that has Kamala in trouble before election day. So do not trade the election. Let's see what, what it has to say. Pains. We're also going to talk about the fact that in response to Trump deranged media, they are now pushing misinformation uh, talking points in order to demoralize, I guess, Republican voters. Why don't we start with probably the biggest story currently right now, which is early voting. And here's Mark Happerin talking about that. Watch. On the pro Trump's going to win side in terms of data, the, the early vote continues to be a problem in terms of how much of a lead she has and the underperformance of black voters. Um, uh, and, and, and let's see tomorrow where, where we are in Pennsylvania, but I, I think the, the, uh, the Delta, uh, uh, the democratic lead is going to be much smaller than even Democrats said they needed to win Pennsylvania. We'll see, but that's a, that's something to watch. Um, in addition, the kind of conventional wisdom amongst Democrats is, and, and they're buoyed by Ann's poll is she's closing strong Trumpism and that undecided that David Plupp argued last week are breaking her way. I think right now, you know, people ask me all the time what's going to happen. I think right now, I can take to believe that for a while. It's not going to be close. Either the makeup of the electorate is going to be 55, 54, 55 percent female, and she's going to win, or it's not, and she's going to lose. And that could be wrong, but I, I don't think it's going to be different state to state. I think in six or seven of the states, the electorate will be so strongly women and so women so strongly for her that she'll win, or not. And that'd be my guess right now that it's going to be one way or the other. So I was thinking about it this morning. Uh, one or two things are going to happen. I saw something that like. 
I believe in 2020, there was like 80 plus million votes cast for each candidate. And we are about at 80 million ish votes right now uh, in the early voting. And I think that's pretty cool, right? Half of the people who are going to vote have already voted. I think that's pretty awesome, right? And I don't think half the people are waiting to hear their final campaign rallies or their final campaign ads to make that decision. I think these decisions were made a long time ago by a lot of people. Happen number one, Roe v. Wade will be the deciding factor of this election. So either the Republicans have massively underestimated the impact of that ruling, or she's just going to lose by a landslide. And the Democrats have underestimated the support for Trump due to their negligence on how they've been handling him as a former president over the past four years. And at the same time, how Joe Biden and Kamala Harris has run this country into the ground. So I, and this is just my personal opinion. I think a lot of people had reached their breaking point with the economy, wokeness, with everything else. And they made their minds up well early. Like things are not as good as it was when Trump was in office. And so there's nothing that the Democrats can do to change my mind. I think a lot of people are feeling that way, right? And especially when the liberal media has run so much about how Trump's a Nazi. Just recently, Trump is trying to uh, put Liz Cheney in front of a firing squad, which was a total, total farce. And it's just one thing after another where it's like these, I, I mean, Kamala's big October surprise where she actually came out had a press conference that was like 45 seconds was basically her reading a script that said Donald Trump loves Hitler. Donald Trump really loves to have um, uh, the generals that Hitler had be working for him. Um, so therefore, nobody should vote for Donald Trump. And then she left. It's like. Nobody cares because you've been saying that since 2015. So the, the threat is empty there. Right. That's not an October surprise. That's like literally every day that ends in Y in the liberal media. So I got to say, I don't think there's really that many people left. In my opinion, I'm totally, you know, welcome to be wrong. That many people left to say, nah, I just haven't figured out who I'm going to vote for yet. Brian's here. He says, did those 11,800 voters uh, in Georgia vote this time? Dude, I don't know. You're there. You tell me. Personal point of preference, isn't the stock market higher than it was when Trump left office? It is. It absolutely is. But that is only one data point. Um, I interviewed somebody in the podcast, feels like 100 years ago, and they were talking about how um, this was right when inflation was ticking off 2021, 2022 timeframe. And they were talking about how uh, inflation is good for stocks, which if you think about it, it really is, right? Um, if all the asset prices are inflated, the assets that you own in your portfolio are, are also inflated, right? It makes total sense to me. Um, so I'm not surprised. Now, the Brian, the better question is, would it have been where it is right now if inflation had been at the same level that it was with Donald Trump? I saw something just, uh, it was earlier today. I, I wish I would have saved it. I would have brought it up. But it showed um, inflation numbers under Trump and Biden. And it was inflation under Trump was like 0.2%. And inflation under Biden was like 30%. I mean, it was outrageous, right? Do you remember way back when, when, um, I, maybe it was Fed Pal, I don't know, uh, was saying how we needed to see inflation get up to 2%. Do you remember that? Inflation needs to go, inflation needs to rise to hit our 2% target. Huh. If only, right? It remains to be seen, of course. But if we're looking at the numbers, which I'm going to show you here shortly, you're more likely to believe Trump is the one that's going to win here. All right. So let's just take a look at this early voting result so far. Uh, clearly, the Republicans are ahead in Arizona. They're ahead in Georgia. In Michigan, they're slightly behind. OK, Nevada, they are ahead. Pennsylvania, they are behind. But the thing about Pennsylvania, it's not counting in-person voting. They're only counting mail-in ballots. Now, uh, I like to believe the Republicans are actually ahead. But that remains to be seen, which we're not. I've heard a lot of stuff that wherever Pennsylvania goes, the race goes. So that does make me nervous right there. I'll be honest. I'm going to find that out until tomorrow. Uh, now, Wisconsin, uh, Republicans are behind uh, as well, slightly. And the independents are actually outperforming uh, Democrats and Republicans. So the bottom line is this. When we look at the early. Wait. The independents are outperforming either of the candidates here. That's crazy. You're Scranton. 
early voting data. This is not where the Democrats want to be. When it comes to Wisconsin, Pennsylvania, Michigan, Nevada, they actually want to be ahead, and they're not right now. And so that's why Kamala Harris is in some serious trouble, because that usually is the advantage when a Democrat is running for the presidency, is that the early voting, the turnout, is significantly more massive if you're comparing it to the Republicans, and it looks like the Republicans learned their lesson from 2020, and now they're showing uh, up in numbers that we haven't seen from the Republican Party in quite some time. All right, so let's take a look at the Electoral College map based on what we just went over and what some of the predictions could turn out to be and look like on Election Day when it comes to the Electoral College. Now, clearly, Trump is ahead in Nevada. We'll give him that. He's ahead in Arizona. We'll give him that. He's ahead in Georgia and North Carolina. So if we stop right here, he's at 268. She is still at 212. Now, the reason why I wanted to show you guys this map, because there's a couple of scenarios that are frightening, in my opinion, that I hope we don't experience. Let me go. Let me knock out that one first. Let's say she wins Minnesota, Wisconsin, Michigan, and Pennsylvania. That puts her at what? 266, and that puts Trump at 268. And it leaves New Hampshire as the deciding factor. Okay? So that is a big deal. So if I turn to New Hampshire for Trump, that's 272. I hope that doesn't happen. I hope whoever wins, they win by a landslide, right? Now, there is another scenario, which is fascinating, where uh, she could win Nevada. And Trump is at 266, and she's at 272. They say that Nevada is going to take uh, about four days to count. And so the reason why I want to show you guys this scenario first is I hope this doesn't happen. But I'd like to talk about it to prepare ourselves mentally is this scenario right here. We're on Election Day or the following day. We're sitting at this number here, 266 to 266. We're Oh, dude, could you imagine? Could you imagine we're tied like that and it goes to a state that needs a couple days to count? Who that that would be some nail biting drama. I don't want any of that. I just want to say a landslide. Waiting for Nevada to decide the election. Nobody's really talking about this, but it is a possibility, by the way. All right. Scenario number two. Uh, that doesn't happen, right? Uh, he wins Nevada, and then all he has to do is pick up one of these states, let's say Wisconsin, and he's at 282. That's still assuming he wins New Hampshire. Even if I put New Hampshire in the column for Kamala Harris, he's still at 278. All right. So one way or another, I went over this before previously. It really just comes down to can she sweep the Rust Belt? And if she can, uh, she has a great chance of becoming the next president. If she can't and she loses one of those states, I mean, the likelihood of him becoming the next president is extremely high. It doesn't matter what happens with Nevada at that point. Now that you guys have kind of heard my opinion about how I see this election moving forward, because I told you guys, it's only two things. One, the Republicans have massively underestimated Roe v. Wade and women will blow Trump out of the water. Or two, the Democrats have massively underestimated Trump's support, the contrast between his administration and Joe Biden. The destruction the Joe Biden Kamala Harris administration has done on the border and the economy. So of course, why don't we? Oh, I didn't even mention the uh, the border issues. Uh, Joe Rogan had John Fetterman on over the weekend, and I haven't listened to the whole thing. I've just listened to clips so far. I, as you know, I like to listen to Joe Rogan. And Joe, if, man, if Kamala had been in there, he would have destroyed her because he went. In fact, give me a minute. I wanna I wanna see if I can find that clip. Because it was really good. Like Kamala would not, I, I, it would have been a one two knockout punch for Kamala. She would have been toast. So, uh, again, uh, what was his name? Uh, John Better and Highlights. Let's see real quick. I don't want to do 13 minutes. I think. Be sure to start on this. Are we sure? Y'all are racist, bro. I just gotta make sure because that, <laughs> that can't possibly. Racist, I'm trying to make sure we don't yeah. have issues. Like, what kind of issues you're talking about? You talking about people letting people in in order to get votes? Uh, well, I, I, it's not. There's not that level of kinds. I don't think there's that level of kinds of organization. But uh, there is an organization that's moving these people to swing states. Well, there's a significant number of these people that are illegal immigrants that have made their way to swing states. And then there's been calls for amnesty. There's been calls for allowing these people to have a pathway to citizenship and allow them to vote. The fear that a lot of people have is that this is a coordinated effort to take these people that you're allowing to come. Now, as you listen to this, consider if Kamala Harris was on the other end of the, of the interview. She, she would probably be like, I grew up in a middle, middle class household, right? Um, the United States is unburdened by illegal immigrants. Like, they, they, it would be nothing. It would be the worst. So I just, this was so good when I saw it.
come into the country, then you're providing them with all sorts of services like food stamps and housing and setting them up well, you, and then you, providing a pathway to amnesty. And then you would have voters that would be significantly voting towards the Democrats because they're the people that enabled them to come into the country in the first place, first place and provided them with those services. This is a big fear that people have and that you're rigging this system and that this will turn all these states into essentially locked blue like California is. Well, I, I, I you know, could you imagine Kamala's answer to that? There wouldn't be, a, there would not have been one. And that's why she didn't go on Joe, go on Joe Rogan because she wouldn't have tolerated a question like that. She probably would have like, just been like, mm, I gotta go deuces. Right. Or she would have spun it in some way to say it's Donald Trump's fault. It's Donald Trump's fault. All of these people are coming uh, in through the border illegally. And it's Donald Trump's fault that they're all going to swing states. It's not our fault. I mean, we didn't do that. He did this, even though he's been out of office for, you know, four years. It's his fault. It's always his fault. All right. Enough of that. Let's get back over to this here and let's go jump into today's member highlight. Okay, so I like to go through the Discord and talk about what's going on, what y'all are saying up in the Discord. It is so much fun. Um, let's see. So Max was asking if the market breadth on a certain sector is higher than the EMA, it means that the sector has more stocks on the bear list. And in fact, let's go do that together. So if we go to the market breadth, and then we can just stay on full stocks. So I like to put on the 10 EMA and I'm gonna zoom in, I'm gonna slam it to the right. What this means here is that if it's 50-50, that means half of the stocks are on the bull list, half the stocks are on the bear list, the green line right there. Okay, if that's at 50%, that's what it would mean. And the bull list means that they have buy signals, the bear list means they have sell signals. There is no other list they can be on, it's either buy or sell. Now, when it's in, uh, below the EMA, that means over the last 10 days on average, is that list moving up or is that list moving down? And as of right now, that list is moving down. So there's less stocks on the bull list, more stocks on the bear list. And you can see it out in numbers here. 987 on the bear list, nine uh, or 896 on the bull list. So it's, it's less than 100 that separates the two, which is why it's right a little bit under 50% but trending down and a green overlay sector or a green sector here means it has a green overlay. So let's go to, uh, we'll go to XLF, which is financials. And you'll see that green overlay here once this loads in. And a green overlay is uh, the uptrend overlay. So it's showing that XLF is inside of an uptrend. Whereas if it's a red overlay, it's in a downtrend, and if it's blue, that means it's in the white sideways uh, overlay, right? So green is bullish trends, white is sideways, and then red is downtrends right here. And Mahesh answered that question. Uh, Tug asked about the Kelly Criterion. So, Tug, when I ran the Kelly Criterion, it gave me a position size that was literally 69% of my portfolio. And that's a bit high. So basically, I could have one and a half, maybe, positions on at any time. And uh, I didn't feel like that was a good choice. So I'm not going down the Kelly Criterion route anymore. Uh, Mark and I went back many times uh, trying to come up with an idea of what that would be for position sizing based on the returns that we're seeing. And he said 15% position size looked to be about right. Like we could have, what is, what is 100 divided by 15? I feel like it's like eight. Oh, no, no, it's not eight. Six positions on at any time, give or take, um, which is more than enough for me. Uh, so I thought that was a, a good question. And that's where I ended up with after going back and forth with Mark. Dave, quick reminder, market opening time has changed for many of us because of daylight savings time. Uh, also, Dave published a trading journal up in Amazon. So y'all go check out Dave's trading journal there. That's exciting. Um, we did have the time change, which I mentioned earlier. So I wanted to mention that I, every time 
we have the time change. Somebody's asking what happened. So I wanted to put that out ahead of time. Uh, Mikey Mike found uh, some information on Fidelity. And Mike and Dave were going back and forth on that and saying, you know what? If I need to go somewhere else, I'll do it. So that's good. Good, good, good. And then uh, Dave just dropped his link. So way to go, Dave. Congratulations on getting that published. That's super exciting. Um, let's jump back over here. Be sure to share your stories in the Discord. Remember, we do this for you. So we're super stoked that you are here uh, doing this with us every single day. And remember, the first rule of Outlier is you tell everybody about Outlier and hit the like button. And that way, YouTube tells everybody as well. Now, let's go to the market. If we go to the market, like I said earlier, the market's going sideways, right? Don't don't touch this market right now. If if the market closes under the 50, this is Shortsville for me. But I did run the screener this morning, and I didn't see any that would have matched criteria on a, a sell signal today. So even if the election wasn't tomorrow, um, I didn't see anything light up for me today. So uh, no, no harm, no foul at the moment. But if this continues down, Shortsville, here we come. Let's go on to the next here, because the uh, market breadth, we just covered that a little bit ago, uh, was bearish. We still have a sell signal on the SPY. Let's let those load in real quick. Dave says, thank you. Our cover and large print are in the works as well. That is exciting, dude. Yeah, we still have a sell signal on the SPY. And market breadth, slam this to the right, is bearish. So. Yeah, we have a lot of opportunities coming in the near future. Peter asks, do you day trade earnings or I don't day trade at all? The, I have tried it many times. I have made money. I've lost money. But mainly what I've lost is uh, hair on top of my head and years of my life. Um, I gave up day trading, honestly, because it doesn't fit my, pro, my, my lifestyle. It doesn't fit my personality. The only thing I'll day trade, Peter, is if I'm in a position and it goes up into an order block, I have rules to get out of it during the day that's the only time i'll day trade right so let's uh let's go to a uh let's go to a, a name and let's look at that real quick what that would look like just so we're all on the same page got to find an old order block that it runs up into hang on dave says he can or not dave peter says he can't imagine yeah dude Looking for some order blocks here. Just a second. I want to give you a good example. What I'm looking for is an old order block that it's um, coming up into. Not one that's just created recently. There we go. Perfect. On Microsoft. Let's make this bigger. <laughs> Large print for Michael. <laughs> okay. So check this out. This is Microsoft. This is such a great example of how good order blocks are. Look at, look at, is this not unbelievable? If you told me you could paint something on the chart with zero effort and it shows you, hey, these are areas that you might not want to trade into, I wouldn't believe you until I'd seen it with my own eyes. And we've done many episodes on how great order blocks are, but look at this. All right, this order block was created in July, 2024. And then it fell. And it's tried the first time it tried it rejected the second time tried rejected the third time tried rejected oh my gosh this is so cool so um my rules with this is i don't mind trading up to an order block right like if i've got two three four percent or so like i can imagine if i'm trading on this candle that's about three percent or this candle here that's about two percent i'm interested Right, I'll, I'll gladly scoop eight and a half dollars out of that. But once it gets up into here, that's when things change. That's when things change because you can see the rejections that happen here. My rules are, if the stock has an order block in the direction of the trend and it moves into the order block on the daily chart, close at the end of the day, right? Because if I'm holding it and it's inside this order block here, um, I don't know where it's gonna go, but more likely it's gonna reject me. Or I can day trade the stock using the five minute chart. So I'll switch it over to five minutes. Okay. I'm going to do that right now, just for examples. But if it goes up into the order block and the 10 and 20 EMAs do not cross back down, I'll hold it all day. Right. The 10 and 20 is your short and intermediate term. If they don't cross back down, 
then you can let it run all day. But if you see the crossover happen, right? It, it, imagine it goes up into that order block and then you get that crossover back down. There's no guarantee that it's going to come back, right? Because the trend is already reversing against you and you've already got this huge overhead supply against you. So it's time to bail. So uh, Peter, that's the only rule I have for day trading. Um, and we haven't used it maybe ever. Uh, or if we have, it's it's not been all that often. But um, yeah, good question though. Um, sorry, wrong thing over here. So I won't be taking any trades today. However, here's the deal. Wednesday, if the market's down, if everything's under the 50, if market breadth is still down, I don't care who's the, the president at that point, that's game on point for me, right? We're not quite there yet. We're not quite to game on point yet because of the election. Now, I'll tell my election story real quick, and then we'll do uh, new trader, rich trader. My election story was in the 2016 election, and, and I know a lot of you have heard this, but not everybody has. In the 2016 election, um, Hillary was expected to win. Uh, I, I just saw something the other day that talked about the betting markets, right? Like we looked at poly market the other day. The betting markets at that time had Hillary with a 90% chance of winning and Trump managed to win. That's crazy. But um, the the prediction was, the, the, the general consensus was, if Hillary wins, the market will go up. If Trump wins, the market will crash. That was the general consensus. Don't ask me why. That's just what it was. Now, when that happened, call re ratio back spread. I was decently new to options. I'd made some money. I'd lost some money. But I had come across this particular trade right here called the call ratio back spread. Now, with a call ratio back spread, imagine the lowest part right there is today's price. If the market goes up, it's like an unlimited call option. Awesome. If the market goes down, it's like selling calls, right? You uh, you can take a little bit of, of premium off there. And basically, either direction works. Now, because Hillary was expected to win and the market was expected to go up, what do you think your, your boy Chris did? He's like, well, I'm going to hedge my bets. If I'm wrong, I'll make a little bit of money. If I'm right, gangbusters, right? I'm so glad this trade happened to me, by the way. never, never. Never look back at a trade where you learned a lesson and think bad on it. Think, look back at that trade and think, man, am I glad I had that trade because it kept me from doing something stupid down the line. So I went to bed that night and I don't know if you remember, and I remember this vividly. I remember going to bed and the market was lock limit down. That was the first time I had seen it lock limit down after hours. It was down 800 points on the, on the Dow. And uh, I got to bed thinking, oh, you know what? The market's going to crash, whatever. I don't really care. Trump's going to win. I'm okay with that, right? And so I was expecting to wake up the next day with a little bit of money in my account. Well, what actually happened was Trump won. Everybody bought stocks for the next four straight years. And while the market went up like gangbusters, while the market went up like crazy, during the time of my trade, until it expired, the market went up from about here to about here. Right. Because I set this to expire on Friday when the election was on Tuesday. That was my mistake. I had the right trade, but the very, very, very wrong execution. Right trade, wrong execution. And because of that, between Tuesday and Friday, or I guess really Wednesday and Friday, I was watching as my account was evaporating by the minute. I saw it going up. I thought, I'm such a genius. I created the best strategy that you've ever seen. I'm going to make money no matter what. I remember bragging about it to my wife. Like, we're, we're good. It's going to be awesome. And then by the end of the week, I'm down like 60% or something crazy like that. And I'm like, how? How did this happen? I was right. So that is my lesson to you is do not trade elections. Do not think that you've got the, the smartest option strategy that's ever been created known to all mankind, right? Listen, I've played with every option combination you can find, trying to find the closest to risk-free trade. I have I have spent probably months, if you add it up, trying 
you know, all the different combinations of options to see what I can do. And it, it, there is no risk free trade. Okay. There is no risk free trade. And this right here was a humongous lesson to me about position sizing and about binary risk, right? Because if I'm all in on one stock, which I think this, I think I had it in spies, queues, and IWM. Like I just went on all the indices. It was, it was just a horrible disaster of a trade. That's for sure. And I don't want you to repeat that. All right, Sebastian, I don't want you to repeat that. So I don't want you to repeat any of the mistakes that I do, which is why I spend time every single day trying to teach you the lessons that I've learned and why I want to spend a little bit of time today um, talking about the lessons that I've learned um, working directly with Steve Burns, the author of this book, as well as lessons you can learn from reading this book. So let's jump into it. We are on chapter six at this point, I think. Oh, are we on part two risk? Hang on. Chapter five. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're in chapter six, part two of risk. Hey, Mikey Mike just got his new trader, rich trader book today. Very cool. It's a really good book. And also, Mikey Mike, I would uh I would suggest grabbing an audible. Dri listen to it while you're driving around. It's really good. The uh the narrator did an incredible job. New traders act like gamblers, rich traders operate like business people. Right? Let's uh let's see what else I highlighted here. Cutting losses was crucial. Many of the stocks he sold with his $250 loss continued to fall, and he would have lost over $1,000 on one of them. He needed to know the amount of money he was willing to risk before he placed the trade, which is why, man, this is really cool to me, right? This is really cool to me going through this, listening to Steve's words of wisdoms, and then pointing out where it fits in with our trading plan, which is why he has to establish his risk before he placed the trade. How do we do that, right? Position sizing, right? Position sizing, and then knowing on the chart, if things go wrong, right? Having your exit rules. By doing that, you're setting yourself up for success twice. The trade may not work out, but you're not gonna blow up your portfolio if you manage your risk correctly. He shook his head and looked down at his desk. He needed to stay on track. It would be foolish of him to buy a stock with no plan. I wanna know. What's the last stock you bought with no plan? Let me know in the chat. Just type in the name of the stock or, or maybe what the catalyst was that caused you to buy that stock. I want to know what stock did you buy without a plan? Oh, Michael says the audio audible version is good. Both books. Yeah. Oh, uh, there is new trader, rich trader too. You, you're right. Let me know the last stock you bought without a plan. It's been so long because for me, I'm not even, I don't even look at the market. I'm not looking at a name. I'm not looking at anything unless I have a plan. I think the one that probably comes to mind for me was AMC, right? During the uh, the meme stock craze in 2021. And I went on TV. I was on Yahoo Finance like right after that talking about how much fun it was because this is my world. I've been doing this for ages and people came into my world and they're like, let's go. Let's. I want to play the game too. And it was so much fun for that window of time. And AMC actually fit all my risk profiles, but I didn't trade it. Well, I did trade it, but it wasn't on my, my radar because it was like four bucks at the time. I ended up doubling my money and got out, but it was so much fun during that time. And the only reason I got in was it came to my attention from all the news. I looked at my uh, trading plan and I'm like, huh, it actually fits everything. It's just lower price than I normally do. I'll give it a shot. So that was pretty fun. Peter says, DJT it was an impulse and he lost. Oh man, DJT. That's uh, the Donald John Trump stock. Oh dude, Peter, if you, L it, right. And that's the other thing, right? You, uh, you always kick yourself and say, if I had only held it, if I had only held it, but who, who could imagine it going down like that and then immediately popping back up? By the way, order block, order block city. Right, came down up into the order block, rejected, came near that order block, rejected, into the order block, rejected again. The order blocks are crazy. Look at this order block out here. I remember what's going on back there, but either way, the first time you see it come into there, rejected. Damn, legit. Mikey Mike says Apple. Remember Apple a few years ago was like the stock. In fact, let's go to the weeklies that or, or the monthlies. Apple 
was, yeah, this is what I remember. This is exactly what I remember. Apple was the one stock that you could just buy and forget about, and it goes up. Um, I don't know if that's still the case, right? Because there is definitely some pullbacks and such, but Apple's, I mean, past performance is not indicative of future results, but Apple has been a monster monster. Michael says, ASTS. Whoa! Did you do well on that, Michael? Because that one was a, a, a huge one. ASTS, what a, what a rip. Woof. Order block. Another order block. That was cool. Michael says he got super lucky. Almost 300% lucky. Oh, man. That is, that's my kind of lucky right there. Peter says it was a Halloween massacre that happened to Donald J. Trump stock. All right, let's go back over here. Uh, when new trader rich, when new trader showed up around noon, it occurred to him that he never saw rich trader watching fin. He never saw rich trader watching financial news. Huh? Kind of like me. Nor did rich trader. I, I watch politics. That's what I watch. Nor did rich trader have fancy trading desks with multiple monitors. I actually have three monitors. I have two uh, curved monitors here. Um, I don't know. They're like 24 inches each. Um, so I have like a full workspace. Uh, some people have like a wall of monitors. Now I've got two, right? And I go back and forth, right? I got StreamYard going on over here. And then the one you see every day is the other one. Um, and then I have like a little cell phone sized monitor um, where I can put things that I want to monitor, right? If I, like I can put the market down there and just like let it be. Like imagine having your cell phone connected to your computer, uh, a computer output. That's what I've got. And it's just like one of those I could just leave on and not bother with. But I get that. Right. Some people love all the monitors. I don't. I just got my two. I don't even consider the third one. It just is down there. Uh New Trader wondered if he was still actively trading. Oh, okay, okay. New Trader wondered if he was still actively trading because he doesn't watch financial news or if he had retired. Like all businesses and disciplines, the psychological aspect is usually the most difficult, said Rich Trader. Being a professional means doing your job no matter how you feel. A trader has two jobs. You're a researcher, right? You are a researcher, right? I, I consider it like a scientist. In fact, um, I did some backtesting over the weekend. I just remembered I can show you. A trader has two jobs. You're a researcher and you're a trader. First, you must do your research. You need to find systems that have a good probability of success in the long term. Test those systems and create a trading plan that fits your personality. This, this is what I preach every day. Decide the correct amount of risk to take on for each trade based on your winning percent and historical drawdown. Then your job is to follow that plan and not change it during market hours, no matter how you feel. Don't change your plan during market hours for sure. Adjustments should only be made in off hours. So I mentioned uh, some back testing I did. Let me show you what I show you what I did. Give me a second here. So Mahesh had asked me to do some back testing because um, we're changing up the changing up the overlays and. Mahesh has seen how well the, the 10, 20, 50 uh, works in his own trading, in his own observations of what we do. So he's adjusting the overlays inside of Outlier to, um, let me go to one so I can show you real quick. He's adjusting the, the overlays in Outlier to mimic that. They were based on an algorithm before, but he's like, wow, the 10, 20, 50 looks really good. And then he and Mark did a, a back test. And you're not going to believe this. Just buying and selling, okay? Just pure buying and selling uh, when the overlay starts, when the overlay finishes, which is basically the 10, 20, 50 versus their um, upturn algorithm. The 10, 20, 50 beat it by 30 percentage points. And I was like, let's go. This is what I've been trading with forever. In fact, I got it from New Trader Rich Trader, if you can believe that. Well, I'm sure we'll come across it at some point. I actually got it from New Trader Rich Trader. And Mahesh was so stoked when he saw that, but he said in the shorts, it doesn't work. In fact, it is about 30 percentage points worse than the red overlays. And so uh, they were like, Chris, we feel like the 10, 20, 50 is probably a great start to the overlay. 
but where is the exit point, right? If we're going to exit it early, where would that be? Not spa, not spy. Where would that exit point be? And so what I did was I uh, ran lots of data this weekend. I did it inside of Trendspider. And it's really cool inside of Trendspider. Let me show you what I did. You can go to Strategy Tester. And you can save all these strategies. You can see all the ones that I did. And you can click one of them. Like 10, 20, 50 right there. And then all I did was change the exit criteria. And I hit uh, Run. Now, none of these are good. They're all um, losers in this case on the shorts. But what I found was in the Variance Explorer, this is such a cool thing here, Variance Explorer. And then you can change to whatever strategy you want. Daily, 7,000 candles in this case, that's the deepest I can do. But you can run it on all these different names all at once. And this is something we did a while ago, but I was really stoked when I found that, right? So, I mean, some of these, it doesn't work all that great. And then some of these, it does really great on like 150%, 125%, 54%. And these are shorts. So what I did was I was like, okay, on a baseline. And so this is what you have to think about as a trader is like, okay, what variable would I change? So I was going through these and I'm like, I could change the 520 or 10, 20, 50. So imagine that's our baseline. In fact, let me mark that gray as our baseline. What variable can I change? So I was changing the first moving average. I was changing the second moving average. Um, I was changing what uh, moving average, if it crosses over, I could get out at. And what I found was the 1520 cross back had the second highest returns in this case, but also the highest win rates. And I was like, it's one percentage point off here. So I was like, wow, that's really cool. Now you as a trader need to do these type of things. You need to find your data and you need to say, what can I do to make some improvements? Where can I go and make those changes off hours to find where I can make improvements? Right? Like it says right here is being a professional means doing your job. No, no, no. You're a researcher and a trader. First, you must do your research. You have to find systems that have a good probability of success long-term and test those systems. So I sent that data over to Mark and Mahesh, and we're still evaluating on the uh, the red overlays, what we're going to do. But that's part of the fun of being a trader, right? You get to discover something that maybe nobody else knows, like Outlier, right? You discovered Outlier. You were having incredible success with Outlier. And you did that by testing and seeing how it was working, right? And part of that testing was probably watching these YouTube videos and figuring out if it was going to work for you. The key to success is to lose small and win big. When you're when you're in a loser, get out. The best trades make money at the buy point. When you're winning, let it run until it stops. You will lose if you don't cut your losses. This is something that I have also really taken uh, account with is that the best trades make money right at the buy point, right? Right at the time you're getting in. And that's what we see with Outlier, right? Is the trades are either going to work right away or they're going to flounder or occasionally they just don't work out and you get out really fast, right? You don't sit and wait and hope that it comes back. There is also one more very important thing. Rich Trader added after a moment, when you go to your computer to trade, you should approach it as if you're entering an auction, not a casino. You should feel like you're going to work for your own business, not like you're playing the slot machine or spinning a roulette wheel. If you experience these feelings or if you just want to gamble, you're going to eventually fail as a trader. Trend traders make money. Chart readers make money. Swing traders make money. Day traders make money. And position traders make money. But all gamblers in the market eventually lose everything. I thought that was solid. Uh, what Michael was talking about is uh, ASTS, huge win. Many people think they're traders when they are more like gamblers who would probably have better odds if they went to Las Vegas. The difference between a trader and a gambler is like the difference between a casino and a gambler. The casino paradigm introduced in Trade Like a Casino by Richard Weissman has helped traders think differently and become more profitable. The casino doesn't risk at all in a single game and has position sizes. Their table limits ensure that a single win doesn't impact their overall profitability. A casino doesn't have emotions. It doesn't care about the players or whether they're winning or losing. In contrast, a gambler can become consumed by emotion. 
a gambler usually has a problem taking their winnings off the table. And they may sometimes they may win sometimes, but gamblers will eventually lose it all in the end. Be the casino. Oh, that was really good. So basically, the moral of the story is have a trading plan and keep your risk in check. And then explore. Do your research. See what you could do that might give you an edge. And then if you're an outlier, tell us all about it so we can all have that edge. <laughs> so uh, I want to say thank you all for coming. I hope you have the best uh, election day eve, right? Thank you so much for coming. Be sure you put out your uh, your milk and cookies equivalent, which is cheeseburgers and, uh, and Diet Coke for Santa Trump. And listen, I want to pay you back every single day by helping you save time, make money, and start winning with less risk together as a team. If you're lucky, you might still get the outlier annual plan for 329. This deal was supposed to end. Mahesh was saying that they had a little glitch and it hasn't uh, changed over as of the time, the last that I heard. So if you're lucky, you can still get it right now if you don't already have it. Let us know if you need anything in the Discord. You're very welcome, Peter. Be sure you tell everybody about it, Peter, right? And hit the like button. I know you're already subscribed. Have a fantastic after outlier afternoon. And Wes says, thanks, Chris. That transpider backtest process looks awesome. Yeah, for sure. Y'all have a great afternoon. I'll see you right back here tomorrow and we will talk soon.